The Lamp, the Ice, and the Boat Called Fish, based on a true story by Jacqueline Briggs Martin. Pictures by Beth Cromes. The Sea Oil Lamp. In the high north, in the summer, when day never ends, an Inupiaq grandmother walked out from her house, one of the last of the old sod houses. She walked under the eye of the sun and the flying raven, and she listened to the song of the land, the wide sky, the sound of the wind, the ptarmigan. She knew she would walk many hours searching for moss, moss to be wicks for the sea oil lamp, the lamp carved from stone by her husband long ago when they both had been young. It was his first gift to her and was as much a part of the old woman as her voice or the ugruk sewing case she always carried. Now she would be the one to give the lamp away. It would go where she could not go. The old woman gathered many pieces of moss, then sat in front of her house. Her granddaughter sat beside her, and they worked together, shaping the moss into rope-like wicks for the lamp. The grandmother sang of the place, the wide sky, the sound of the wind, the ptarmigan. She told the girl, you are going on a boat for a long time. Take this lamp and the song. Take part of your home. Then the girl went with her mother, father, little sister, and her father's friend. They climbed into an umiak and rowed out to the white men's boat, the boat called Fish. The boat called Fish, pack ice, the sea ice that covers northern oceans for much of the year. The boat was built in the 1880s to carry salmon and was named Carluck, a Lucian for fish. After a while, it carried crews to hunt bowhead whales. Then the whaling stopped and the Carluck had no work until the summer of 1913 when it sailed north from British Columbia toward the Arctic Circle. There were no fishing crews and no whalers on board, but scientists of the Canadian Arctic Expedition traveling up the coast of Alaska to study the plants and people in the high north. The leader of the group was an explorer named Stephenson. He wanted to find new islands in the icy ocean. There were also a cook, a captain, a crew, one black cat, and 40 sled dogs. When the boat reached Point Barrow, Stephenson invited an Inuak family to join the expedition. Stephenson knew the group would need fur clothes and boots of caribou and seal skin to survive the Arctic cold. They would need fresh meat from seals and ugric bearded seal. Kiruk, the mother, could look at a man, cut a fur skin with her round bladed ulu, and sew a pair of pants that would fit him exactly. She could make boots that would keep his feet from freezing. Kuraluk, the father, and his friend Katuktowik were good hunters. They had the patience to wait by seal holes for hours. Kuruk and Kuraluk brought their two daughters. Pagnasuk was eight years old, and little Mukbi was two. The crew built a place on the deck for the family to live. Inside their small room, they had a seal oil lamp that gave warmth and light. Perhaps the two girls had a ball, made of seal skin and filled with caribou hair to toss and catch. The crew never heard them cry. They played while the 40 dogs howled and fought and the black cat ran in the galley. Winter came early in 1913, and soon the captain was steering the ship between huge chunks of ice, some as big as houses. In mid-August, the boat was stopped by a large sheet of ice, up to a foot thick and dotted with water holes. As the weather grew colder, the water thickened with gray needles of new ice. While Pagnasuk and Mapki tossed their sealskin ball, while the carpenter taught tricks to the black cat, while the sled dogs scraped, and while they all slept, the ice around the boat froze solid. Then the boat and the ice were one, and the boat could go only where the ice went. That was when the leader, Stephenson, and five others left the boat with sleds and dogs to hunt caribou. They were on land when a storm blew the ice-locked boat out to sea. Stephenson sent a report to the government in Ottawa that the car luck would probably be sunk by ice, but he was sure its passengers would survive. Then Stephenson was off to look for new land. Two, locked in the ice. Flow, a piece of sea ice. Flows can vary in size and grow up to many square miles. In one winter, an ice flow might grow to a thickness of one yard. An ice flow will continue to grow each winter. 
If it is not crushed by a larger piece of ice, it can reach a thickness of 30 feet or more. That was when the boat's captain, Robert Bartlett, became the leader. That was when Quirk sewed every day. No one could tell what would happen. Would the boat sink? Would they have enough food? Would they be able to stay warm in the cold, dark winter? As long as the ice was solid, the boat was safe. If the ice should crack, then wind or water would be strong enough to push a piece of ice through its wooden sides and the boat would sink. I do not think that Pagnasuk and Macpai worried about the boat. They knew about cold. They were born into cold, and they trusted their father and mother to keep them safe. I think they sat by the lamp and played with their ball, and perhaps Quirk had made them dolls from seal skin. She knew the secrets of sewing and might have made tiny fur parkas for their dolls. While they played, Quirk sewed boots for all the people on the boat. For the leg of each boot, she used the skin from caribou legs that she had scraped until it was soft and strong. For the sole, she used the skin of the urgruk. She shaped it by chewing it, then pinching it with her thumb and fingers. When the shape of the sole was just right, she set it to dry. It took Kurik a whole day to sew one sole to one boot top, but when she was done, the boots were strong and watertight. Without those boots, feet would freeze and people would die. Kurik used her ulu to cut fur skins for pants and parkas for the crew and the scientist and she showed them how to sew their own clothes. They called her auntie. Every day, Kiraluk and Katatovic went out on the ice to look for seals. They brought back enough fresh meat for the 25 people on the Carluck, the 28 dogs, and the cat. For three months, the boat continued to drift in its icy trap. Wherever the wind and water took it, the crew and the scientists used boxes and barrels to build the walls of a house on a large ice floe not far from the ship. That ice was 30 feet thick and half as big as a football field, able to stand a good deal of knocking, the captain wrote later. In December, while the ice shifted, groaned, and scraped about around the him, Karaluk worked in the Arctic twilight and built a house of snow next to the box house. Mr. Hadley, the ship's carpenter, made three long sledges or sleds. They all knew that if the ship did sink, they would have to haul their clothes and food supplies to land. They kept themselves busy and even had holidays. When Christmas came, the captain, the Inupiat, the scientist, and the crew feasted on oysters and bear steak, cake and biscuits. The captain gave Auntie a comb, a looking glass, and a new dress. He gave Mapai and Pagnasuk new dresses too and he gave Kurilak and Katatovic new hunting knives. They ran races and had a tug of war and everyone was jolly. No one talked about when the boat might sink. On New Year's Day, they went out on the ice to play soccer. Kurik was goaltender. The air was so cold the captain could not blow the whistle. Nine days later, at the end of the day, when Pagnasuk and her sister may have been sitting by the seal oil lamp, Listening to their father tell stories of a ten-legged polar bear, they heard a loud, splitting sound. A large, sharp point of ice was breaking through the side of their boat. All hands abandon ship, the captain called. He sent Kurik and the two girls to the box house to start a fire in the stove so all would have a warm shelter. The others carried supplies off the ship and onto the ice floe. The carpenter took the black cat to the box house in a basket. They could not see where they were going in the dark night and blowing snow. The ship's doctor fell into the sea and had to be pulled to safety. After everyone else had left the Carluck, Captain Bartlett sat in the galley next to the stove and played records on the ship's record player. He called it his duty to stay with the ship until it went down. When each record was finished, he threw it in the stove's fire. The captain played music all night long and all the next morning, slowly, slowly water filled the ship. By afternoon, he knew it was time to leave. He put on the last record, Chopin's funeral march and stepped onto the ice. He took off his hat and said goodbye to the boat. Everyone stood outside to catch the carluck as it disappeared underwater. By the next morning, the ice was solid. The carluck was locked under the sea. The 13 crew members, the captain, the six scientists, the Inuak family, their friend Katatovic, and dogs and the cat were left on an island of blue ice in the cold, dark Arctic. 3. The Island of Ice. The Sounds of Ice. 
Cracks that form in the ice and widen into leads or lanes of open water often quickly freeze over with new ice. As new ice is pushed against the old ice, the weaker piece breaks. The constant pushing, breaking, and piling of ice results in groaning, scraping, thrumming sounds. Sometimes when the ice cracks, it sounds like a gunshot. They called their place Shipwreck Camp. The box house on the floe was warm and snug. It had only one room, smaller than a schoolroom. At one end of that room was the kitchen with a cook stove. Another stove sat in the center of the room. On three sides, built against the wall, were bed platforms made of wood taken from the boat. Macpie, Pagnasuk, and their parents had their own sleeping room, with its stove and bed platforms, made of snow, connected to the box house, and they all ate together. Once they were all settled in a shipwreck camp, Quirik and the men began sewing again. Without the right clothes, people could not make the long journey over the sea ice to Wrangell Island. They sewed the fur clothes by hand and had two sewing machines for the other clothes. They used lanterns and lamps for light. There was still no sun, only twilight in the middle of the day. But they must have had the seal oil lamp. The burning seal blubber would have made their little room on the ice smell like their home near Point Barrow. While they listened to the eerie music of the ice, perhaps Peng Sunk watched the flame and sang her own song of the wide sky, the sound of the wind, and the ptarmigan, two little magpie, and the seal skin dolls. One day in January, Kuraluk, Katavuk, and five of the crew left to find Wrangell Island. The Inupak men knew how to travel over sea ice with dogs and sleds. The captain wanted four crew members to stay on Wrangell Island and begin setting up a new camp. The other three could help on the journey and then return to ship shipwreck camp. While they were gone, the sun came back to the sky, ending 71 days of twilight and dark. Everyone in the box house celebrated with oyster soup. After supper, they gathered around the stove. Someone made music with a comb and the others sang. The captain liked to dance. I can see him dancing with a carpenter. Curic sang hymns the missionaries had taught her. Peng Sunk sang Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. One day, when the captain thought the three travelers would surely return, he ordered the crew to build a fire with 13 sacks of coal, a wooden boat, and 10 tins of gasoline. He wanted to be sure Kiriluk and the others could see the fire and find the small camp among the huge fields of ice. But no one came. There might have been trouble. Travel over sea ice is dangerous. Sometimes the new ice is soft and travelers fall through into the deep cold water. Sometimes it cracks and breaks away and a person is trapped on a piece of ice floating out to sea. And there is always the worry of frozen toes, frozen feet, frozen fingers. Every day, Kurik, Magpie, and Pangsuk would climb a hill of ice and watch for men with dogs and sleds. Maybe Pangsuk practiced tossing and catching sticks because it reminded her of her father. Maybe she looked into the seal oil lamp and heard her grandmother singing the song of home, and she did not feel so lonely. Then, one day, on the hill of ice, they heard sled dogs barking. Even though they could not see him, they knew their father was coming home. The travelers had not gone all the way to Wrangell Island because they had come to a lead, a space of open water, too wide to cross. The four crew members said they would wait until the lead froze over and then walk over the ice to the island. As the days went by, the captain began to worry about the men still on their way to Wrangell Island. He decided it was time to leave shipwreck camp. Kurik repa repaired snowshoes. Karaluk and Kataktovik put long handles on their snow knives so they could build each igloo more quickly when they had to stop at night. They knew it would take many days to walk almost 100 miles from their camp to Wrangell Island. The day before they left, everyone took a bath and put on clean underwear. There would be no changing of clothes once they started. They left in the early morning when it was still dark. The black cat was tucked into a sack the men had made for her and rode on top of one sled. Karaluk, Quirik, Magpie, Pangasuk, and the cook took another sled loaded with supplies. Kurik carried Magpie on her back. Pansuk helped her father and five dogs pull the sled. They went out into the dark over the sea ice toward land.